Hi, this is a continuation of heat engine cycle examples, part one. We'll look at toy model number two. So this is still a toy model. It's not a representation of a realistic heat engine cycle, but it's an illustrative example that'll show you some calculational techniques and what you will need to know when you are ready to analyze a realistic heat engine cycle in part two of these videos. So uh, let me sketch out the uh, thermodynamic process here. We start from the low pressure, low volume, and the system undergoes isochoric heating, reaching the high pressure point. And then it's going to undergo isothermal expansion. This curve is supposed to look like one over x or one over v and the system undergoes isobaric contraction. All right, we are asking the same questions as before. That is, what are the network done and the heat transfers? And we went through this before, so let me write down the equations that you are going to need. The ideal gas law, the first law of thermodynamics, and the expression for the internal energy. Let's say it's a monatomic gas. This can also be expressed in terms of purely pressure and volume with the help of the ideal gas law. All right, so we'll refer to this as needed. So without further ado, let's start the analysis. So let's say this system starts from this point, A undergoes isochoric heating, reaching point B undergoes isothermal expansion, reaching point C, and then returns to the original point by isobaric contraction. All right, so the process from A to B looks very much similar to what we analyzed before. In fact, it's the same process. So let's go through it. The network done is zero, no change in volume, and change in internal energy is 3 halves times the difference of pressure times volume. So the ending pressure times volume, high pressure times low volume, minus 3 halves low pressure times low volume. And since the work done is zero, this amount of internal energy change is due to the heat transferred from A to B. If you look at this expression carefully, you can see that it's positive, so that means there's a heat inflow during this isochoric heating. Kind of makes sense. Now, the thermodynamic process from B to C is interesting. So here, instead of being able to say something about work right away, we can actually say something about the internal energy change right away. If it's uh, isothermal, that means temperature isn't changing, so internal energy is not changing. So that means, from the first law of thermodynamics, we can say the heat transfer from B to C is equal to the work done. Now, it's not that easy. Um, there's a bit of a problem we have to work out here, in that the pressure changes throughout this process. So we can't just say work done is pressure times change in volume. Instead, we need to say that the infinitesimal amount of work done is equal to pressure times the infinitesimal change in volume. And in order to calculate the total amount of work done, we would need to integrate from point B to C. All right, so this is where we use the ideal gas law to express the pressure here in terms of volume, the integration variable, and other things that are hopefully constant. Now, because it's an isothermal process, the temperature here is constant. In fact, uh, let me put a little subscript, T sub H, so that I know that it's a number. It's not temperature as a variable, it's a temperature along that isotherm that the process is taking place. The volume is changing from the low volume to the high volume. 
All right, I think I know how to do this integral. Integral of 1 over x is natural log of x. So factor out the constant, n kt, times the antiderivative, evaluated from the low limit to the high limit. Now, when you plug in those limits, this is what you get. Natural log of vh minus natural log of vl. And doing a little bit of logarithm algebra, we get natural log of vh over vl. As you will see later, that form is going to be more useful, so let me write that in instead. And as I wrote earlier, this is the heat transfer from B to C. Carefully looking at this number here, since vh is greater than vl, this is a positive number. That means there's a heat inflow during this expansion here. All right, I think that's all of the heat input. So this is a good point to pause for a bit and calculate the heat input to the system. So heat input is equal to heat input in process A to B plus heat input process B to C. And it doesn't really simplify here, so I'll just write it down. I can do one simplification. Instead of writing this in terms of temperature, I can write it in terms of pressure and volume. This would be equal to high pressure times the low volume. So with that, this is the expression for the total heat input. All right, let me highlight this so that I can find this easily later. Okay, we have one more process left. The isobaric contraction from C back to A. I think we've done this before. So there is work done. That's the end point, PLVL minus the starting point, PLVH. And looking at this carefully, you can see that this is negative. All right, change in internal energy is calculated the same way as the previous example. It's uh, 3 halves, the ending point, PLVL, minus 3 halves, the starting point, PLVH. So the heat transferred is calculated using first law of thermodynamics, change in internal energy, plus the work done. is equal to 5 halves PLVL, minus 5 halves PLVH. Staring at this for a bit, you can see that this is negative. So that means the heat flows out of the system in this isobaric compression. In fact, that's the only segment where heat flows out of the system. So this gives the QL. Or rather, QL is the minus of this, since it's a by convention defined to be positive. All right, let me highlight this so that I can find it later. All right, so those are the heat transfers. Let me write out the network done, which is the work done in the step B to C plus the work done in the step C to A. It's already negative. So combining those two results, we get, all right, it doesn't really simplify. I guess we better plug in numbers to see what that looks like. All right, so as before, you can algebraically verify that the network done is equal to QH minus QL. But let me leave that to you. You can do that on your own if you want to. As before, I want to plug in some interesting numbers to continue to develop our number sense. Let's uh, pick numbers that are comparable to what we picked for toy model number one. So let's say that the low pressure is approximately one atmosphere or 10 to the five pascals. Now in toy model number one, we chose the high pressure to be double this, but I want to make the temperatures comparable for the reasons you'll see later. So that means the highest temperature point in toy model one was the four times the lowest temperature since it's double the pressure, double the volume. So I'm going to make this high pressure point be equal to four times 10 to five Pascal. 
So the low volume point should be similar. So 1 liter or 10 to minus 3 cubic meter. And as it turns out, because we specified this process to be isothermal, we don't actually have a freedom to pick our high volume point. This has to be pH over PL times VL. So our high volume point has to be 4 liters. All right, let me clear out some space here so that I can plug in numbers. All right, so the network done is pH times VL, that's 400 joules times the natural log of plus PLVL or 100 joules minus PLVH or 400 joules. So I'm going to have to use calculator for this. All right. My calculator says that the work done is about 255 joules. Oh, huh. that's interesting. All right, let's calculate the heat expelled from the system. Let me move this so that there's room to write numbers. So plugging the numbers, 5 halves PLVH or 400 joules minus 5 halves PLVL or 100 joules. That's equal to um, 300 divided by 2. 150 times 5, 750. Now, like before, we can use conservation of energy to figure that QH must be work done plus QL, or 1,005. So when you look at these numbers, it looks a little bit better here. This is about 25% of the input heat, whereas before, 100 out of 650 was close to 15%. So proportionally, greater portion of the input heat is being turned into work. Now, you might wonder what uh, allowing this toy model number two to be more efficient compared to the toy model number one. And when we come back for heat engine cycle examples part two, we are going to look at a theoretical heat engine cycle that was devised to, to maximize the percentage of input energy that's turned into mechanical work. It's called the Carnot cycle, and we'll come to that when we get there. But the calculation there is a little more involved, so we'll reserve that until later. So until then, bye.